by Brandon Cooks. Shoot your arrows. Cooper Cup plucks it out of the air and gives the Rams the lead. Robert Wood, touchdown. LA. Ball goes crashing into the end zone. Aaron Donald almost beat the football there. Corey Littleton, have yourself a day. Picked off. Marcus Peters. Coming off the edge. And Ryan will be wrapped up by Clay Matthews. Everett in stride. Wow. Franklin Myers gets his hand down there. Leno got a hand on it. Did he pick it? He did! Racing down the sideline is a key to lead. Gurley for MVP! Touchdown LA! Picked off by John Johnson. Well, Dante Fowler, who is able to get to breathe. Greg Zerline sends the Rams to the Super Bowl! Oh! LA wow. will play for the Lombardi! Welcome back to the show, episode 226. We're joined here, NFL Network insider Steve Weish. How's it going, man? Thanks so much for coming on. Hey, man, thanks for having me on. I thought it was so cool the other day. Um, I think I did an NFL Network hit on Todd Gurley or something, and you chimed in on it, and I liked it. And you're like, hey, man, you keep liking our tweets. Why don't you come on the podcast? Absolutely. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm fired up, man. I'm, I'm glad to be on. That's awesome. Well, we're big fans of you, so we're excited to hear that. And uh, to start it off, I, I've got to bring this up. Uh, I mentioned this to you a little bit off air, but you're from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. So being there from there myself, I'm just curious to know uh, what your thoughts are and your memories were uh, growing up here in St. Louis. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm glad I, I'm glad I did. You know, I um, I moved there when I was about 10 or 11 years old from Minneapolis. So I'm a, just a Midwesterner all the way through. And, uh, you know, when I was there, it was the football Cardinals and the baseball Cardinals. Uh, the Rams were still in Los Angeles. In fact, they tended to knock the football Cardinals out of the playoffs on the rare occasion when the Cardinals did get into the playoffs. Um, but, no, it was great. You know, I grew up uh, – Went to high school out, you know, out in the suburbs, out from near where you're from, and uh, had a great experience. I still have some family members who live there and some dear friends who live there who are, who are, you know, crushed Rams fans that, you know, the team relocated out to Los Angeles where I live now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic place, fantastic to grow up, but I don't miss the weather, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I don't miss the humidity. Yeah, that's it's intense. It's intense. <laughs> it's intense. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously, you know, you're you're killing it in this this uh, sports media business. Everyone knows who you are now. I mean, you're you're the superstar media guy. But, uh, you know, before you got to this point, um, you played football. You know, what was the experience like being around this game? Yeah. Um, first off, very kind words. I don't. I don't know if I'm uh, if I'm quite that electric, but I appreciate it. I'll take it. Um, <laughs> but no, I uh, I could believe I played high school football in in St. Louis at uh, you know Parkway South High School and got recruited to play college football. Started at the University of Missouri for a couple of years where I was terrible. I was a glorified blocking sled, and the coaches got uh, the coaches got fired and. The coach that brought me in got fired. Um, so the new coach who came in, Woody Woodenhofer, had no use for me. And I don't blame him because I was really not good. And uh, so I transferred out to Howard University in Washington, D.C. And really got my journalistic chops going. I was with this incredible group of, of people in my in my class. Um, Stan Verrett, who is a co-anchor on ESPN. Gus Johnson, oh, yeah. who's a sportscaster um, like on Fox. You know, and you know Michelle Miller, who's on CBS News, and Frederick Whitfield, who's on CNN. We have this incredible class of just um, grinders and hardworking journalists, and we pushed each other. Um, so you know, I went the print route. I was in the newspaper business for a good twenty years. I worked in Richmond, Virginia, and in Miami, um, and in Washington D.C. and then Atlanta. And then in 2007, uh, after you know me and my partner Daryl Ledbetter really was a dog wagging the tail on the Michael Vick dog fighting story. Um, that really kind of pushed me on the national scene, NFL-wise, because I'd covered the NBA and a lot of other sports previously. Um, but that Vic story kind of pushed me onto the scene, um, had some potential offers, and uh, well, I had some offers and took one with the NFL Network, and that has worked out well. It was based in Atlanta at the time. They moved me out to L.A. in, in 2011. Love living here. My family's here. And um, – you know, things have gone the way they've gone. So it's 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 been a, a glorious career. It's something I've always wanted to do. 
My father was uh, in the business behind the scenes uh, when I lived in St. Louis, KSDK Television. He worked in the sales department. So I'd always kind of been around it and aspired to do it. I uh, wanted to be the next Brian Gumble. And you know what? I, I'm, I'm not ever going to be the next Brian Gumble because he's, he's just fantastic. But um, I'm, I'm really living, a, living the dream. Yeah, I mean, you've certainly been doing big things. And, and, you know, as Jake mentioned earlier, just absolutely killing it. So I'm curious what your advice would be to someone trying to break into the sports media field. Yeah, it's so different um, from when I came in. I mean, when I came in, it was basically newspapers, magazines, or television. And, you know, there was no digital media. Uh, there was no such thing. The Internet came around, you know, in the, in the early 2000s when I was at the Washington Post covering the NBA. So, I mean, the – from let's say even from the high school level, I mean, the, the, no matter what level you are, you have to know how to write. Um, and I tell people who hate to write, like, look, you write 90% of your day, you text. That is a form of writing. So you have to learn how to write. You've got to have the basics of journalism. But now you've got all kinds of outlets. You've got blogs. You've got digital media. You know, there, there's just so many different ways. The video, there's so many people who started their careers now by doing things and posting them on YouTube, looking impressive, and they've already got a real um, by the time they graduate from college or whatever. Um, but more than anything, you have to know your stuff. Um, and being in this business for as long as I have, you know, you can be the greatest looking person in the world. You can have the greatest voice. You can have the most awesome delivery. But if you don't know your stuff, you get exposed very quickly. And, and you see it all the time. You see the broadcasters who are readers, um, you know, meaning reading prompters. And you see the people who know their stuff which I like to pride myself about because I'm incredibly prepared. I'm not going to be, um, I'm always incredibly observant. Um, I, I pay attention to everything that's going on in the world, not just in the sports world, because now in sports, things really interact. Like when I broke the, the Colin Kaepernick story a couple of years ago, I was able to really um, cross all walks of life and all boundaries, news, society, things like that. So, I mean, the, the best thing is to be informed and you've got to be committed. I mean, it, posers, posers get exposed. And, and, and that's, you know, that's the biggest warning I have for you. But if you think just because you look good and you sound good, and you've got some connections, that you're going to last in this business. I mean, you may get your foot in the door, um, but you also, that door swings both ways. And you just really have to be prepared. You have to treat people well. That doesn't mean they have to like you. Um, but you've got to treat people well and cultivate and, and grow and nurture. There's a, there's, a, there's a very high push for instant gratification these days. Um, and it takes time. You know, I've been in this for 30 years now and I'm, I'm still, I'm still new at this. That's how I take it. <laughs> yeah. I think what you said is absolutely spot on. And, you know, I, I think, you know, back then, I mean, you might've been able to even get away with it more, but this is the, you know, the era of you know, one second sound bites. So <laughs> you do get exposed, you know, very often, uh, you know, yeah, and, if, if you are in that situation. And sports fans are smart. I mean, I had this, this, this legendary sports editor at the Washington Post named George Solomon who told me never underestimate the IQ of the sports fan because sports and entertainment are the only realms in Americana where – an eighth grade dropout can talk the New England Patriots with somebody with five degrees from Harvard. So again, if you don't know your stuff, you're going to get called out on it. And now there's, again, there's, there's more avenues for people to call you out on it via Twitter, radio, blogosphere, Reddit, whatever. Um, if you're not, if you're not in the know, then you're going to get exposed. And then it's, it's going to be a very short life in this, in this industry. Yeah, I I completely agree with that. I think that's again just a great way of putting that. And um, you know, we're going to dive into uh, you know, some Todd Gurley questions here, of course. You know, he's one of the the main focal points of uh the Rams right now and and the news. Um, but real quick, I want to get your thoughts or or just get an idea of how things go at the NFL Network because you have yourself uh, you have Ian Rappaport, you have uh, Mike Garofolo, and I'm sure I'm missing some others there um, that do break news. So how do you guys go about doing that? Do you get you know assigned to certain like sectors of the country? Like how does that work? That's a great question because you know I don't really break news anymore. Um, I do break news, but that's just kind of the here and there thing. I could, um, but you know, Ian, Mike Garofolo, and Tom Pelissero are are our insiders, so to speak. They're the ones, and, and they spend just about every waking hour of every day 
texting, calling agents, players, teams, G, you know, the GMs, you know, the, the train, the guys who train these guys uh, off the field. I mean, that's, that's what they do. Okay. There's, what they do is they report that instant news. There's not always a ton of nuance or context because, Hey, you get it, you report it. Boom. People want news. They want it right away. Now let's update it from there. Let's respond to it and push it forward. I'm one of the push it forward guys. Now I am a reporter. I've, I'm the one person at the network who wears just about every hat. Um, I write for the website. I do break news. Um, I am considered an analyst and I do hosting as well. So I, I do a lot of different things and, and that's what I want to do. My, my journalistic muse is, is Anderson Cooper, who, who does a, a million different things for CNN. And I, you know, I pattern myself of what I want to do to touch all the bases like him. And so I, you know, I do all of that. Then we have field reporters like Stacey Dales and, and Jane Slater and Tiffany Blackman and Omar Ruiz. There's all these fantastic people, MJ Acosta, who are in different areas. Like Omar is in Los Angeles with me. So him and I, when we do go out in the field, we do Rams, Chargers, Arizona Cardinals, Seattle Seahawks. MJ Acosta is really locked in on the Bay Area. Jane Slater lives in Dallas. So she's got the Cowboys and pretty much the Saints and, and sometimes the Houston Texans. Duh. James Palmer lives in Denver. He's He's got the AFC West outside of Oakland for the most part. So a lot of things are broken up regionally. And then depending on which show you're on. You know, we all of us touch all of the shows. That's that's from Good Morning Football to Up to the Minute to The Aftermath, which is the studio show I'm on, to Total Access. So there's a lot of different hats different people wear. Um, you know, but the biggest question we typically get is, you know, what's it like covering – the, a league that signs your paycheck, you know, are we, are we mouthpieces? Are we state run media? And no, we're not, you know, we, we give journalistic freedom. Like I've never been told, Hey, we're not going to investigate, you know, we're, we're not going to don't, don't go do that story. But you know, the, the, the one kind of thing where they do pull the reins a little bit is in investigations. Like let's say deflategate, you know, they might say, Hey, we're going to report all the news on it, but we're not going to be the lead investigators on it because this is one of our clubs. And you know, we have to see where there's a lot of legal things, X, Y, and Z. But other than that, we've got all the freedom in the world. If there's news, we're going to be trying to be the first ones to report it, report it the most thoroughly and to discuss it, to really treat the fans um, of the NFL, to give them what they want, because we're a, we're a one sport network, you know, so other networks, you can whatever they've got, college basketball and major league baseball and things. Yeah. But we serve, you know, we serve one audience and we, we try to serve it the best we can. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I, I would definitely um, call you a, a jack of all trades. I mean, you definitely do it all and it's really impressive. Uh, but you know, I'm just curious, is there one area that you, um, I don't want to say prefer, but, or, uh, like best, but is there one area, you know, out of all the things that you mentioned that you feel you really uh, connect with the most? I, I think it's the storytelling and, and putting nuance to news. Um, you know, because, you know, I, I am as old as I am. I'm just above 50. Um, I've lived a good amount of life. I've seen a lot of things. So I can put things into context. I know a lot of these coaches, a lot of these players, a lot of these general managers. So you know, some of the things they may tell me, you know, on background or off the record, I can take the news and really put it in a nice kind of slider size sandwich for somebody to sink their teeth into and, and to really enjoy and to really understand. And and that's, you know, that's what I really like to do, to humanize things, to contextualize things so people can really understand what's going on. And sometimes like the really, the really good reporters, they're hoping that these brilliant sports fans can see through some of the things that aren't being said. Like, let me put it to you this way, but maybe if I'm not saying a certain thing, you'll really get to emphasize, you know, you'll really understand what's going on here. So it's, you know, but the, the whole entertainment aspect of it, you know, I used to love the breaking news, but you know, that, that's, that's, all, that's a real, I did it in the NBA. And it's, it's a strenuous, I mean, Adam Schefter and Rappaport and Jason Lock and four of these guys, that is a brutal existence. Cause you go to bed every night, like, man, what calls didn't I make? And then you wake up early, like, Oh my God, this guy's got that story. This guy's got that story. I've got to follow up on that. It's, it is a stressful existence and you know, I'm kind of over that. They can have that, you know, they do a great job with it. 
I'll just kind of be, I'll just kind of ride in the sidecar and add a little hot sauce and, uh, and mustard to it to make it taste a little better. <laughs> no, I, 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 I like that. <laughs> I like that you didn't mention ketchup because, uh, <laughs> uh, that is ketchup and mayonnaise are the two condiments I do not get down with. So uh, I try to, I try to just keep that from coming in, in my lips <laughs> and coming out of my mouth. <laughs> So I, I I assume you don't like that you know what is it the ketchup uh, mayo thing now that they came out with yeah it's just disgusting you know that you no know, the Thousand Island all you can try to spice it up anyway I know it's in there so I am not that guy <laughs> <laughs> well that's uh, that's good to know I mean that though you know we've got some important information there we know that you don't like uh, ketchup or, or mustard so you know there's no mustard there's that is good there. mayonnaise mayonnaise is oh good. mayonnaise sorry mustard there you yeah, go mustard is good there <laughs> you go <laughs> uh, so you know moving on uh you know todd Gurley, big number 30 um yep. everyone's talking about him i mean we can't go on instagram live or, or facebook live or any live without being asked if if todd Gurley is gonna play this year and, and I, he's gonna play that's not that's not my question uh alexis and i are pretty well informed in todd Gurley, but um you know, you're more informed. So my question for you is, you know, basically health wise, how do you see this season playing out for him? Well, do you see it more of a, a pitch count or, you know, where are we going with this whole thing? I, I think so. Here's the deal. There's, and I've talked to a million people about this with the Rams, with a personal trainer. So, so here's the science on it. Is there something in the knee that's potentially degenerative? Yes, he had a major ACL surgery when he was in college. So, you know, he, he feels that. he You know, anybody who's had a procedure, you wake up at a certain day and you're feeling it. And last year, I mean, he had a ton of carries. And keep in mind, it's not just the touches that running backs have. They've got to pass protect. They've got to block guys like Von Miller coming off the edge. They've got to, There's a lot of things that goes into playing that position. That's why they've got such a, a brutal existence um, playing running back. So they really – Todd Gurley the past couple of years, I think since he's come into the league, he's got the most touches out of any run. So he, that, that knee, it flared up on him. He took a hit. Um, I don't want to say – it might have been the Chiefs game or the game after. He took a real funny – like a, like he's going out of bounds and it kind of an odd tug or something where you could tell he was bothered by it. And then he, he missed the next couple of games and it came back. So moving forward – they are they are just not risking it. It is a wear and tear type thing. He is going to play. I would expect him to be rotated a little bit more. I don't I don't see him necessarily getting 25, 26 carries. I mean, if you watch what Sean McVay does, nobody on offense comes off the field. They do not change personnel. Todd Gurley was on the field ninety percent of the time, and, and I think that that number is going to reduce. I think you know they drafted a running back. They got Malcolm Brown back. Um, so I think they're, they're going to rotate him a little bit more because they want him there on the end at the end of the season. And one thing I, I want to point out, you know, people forget everyone says, oh, he wasn't that good in the playoffs. He came out, he, he had a very strong game against the Cowboys, right? And then oh, yeah. in the, next week, the next week against the Saints, he had the yips. It wasn't an injury thing. Everyone thinks, oh, he just wasn't this. And he had the yips. He came out and he fumbled. He seemed like his, his, he just wasn't there. So Sean McVay, because the Saints were steamrolling him, didn't have time to, to wait around. That's why they went with C.J. Anderson. And then they got to the Super Bowl. And Sean McVay, and, and I'm glad he kind of said this a couple weeks ago, that you know he, he overthought. Those two weeks gave him time to overthink things. Todd Gurley was, no, look, he might have been bothered by it a little bit, but he was functional. There were some plays there where, where he made some big plays. I think there was a penalty on one of them. But mm-hmm. McVay, he just didn't use him. He just didn't. He didn't. He didn't run the ball. They didn't try. It. They did not play. I covered a lot of their games last year. They did not play that game like they played the other eighteen games they played that season. And and that's where Sean McVay. Again, I'm glad he kind of took a little bit of the of the self. You know, when, when he criticized himself a little bit, like I overthought. And I thought he did. I'm watching the game. Like this is not the same Rams. Because I think Gurley could have been fine. They just didn't use him very much. So, again, moving forward, there's going to be something there. They're, they're, they're going to maintain him. But Todd Gurley, I think, is still going to be an explosive player. As I reported um, a week ago, he's going to play about six pounds lighter. He's going to play about 218. Um, he played about 224 
last season. So that's just to keep the speed up, take a little bit of pressure off that knee. But the fact that we're talking about the knee and that they're they're maintaining it, it goes to show you there's there's a, there's a little something going on, but it's nothing. It's, it's, it's so many people with the Rams that makes them fear that he's all of a sudden going to break down midway through the season. Yeah, and, and something that you brought up uh, as well was the fact that the Rams did draft a running back. They drafted Darrell Henderson out of Memphis. Yep. Uh, do you view that? Um, do you view Henderson as a player that can make an impact in the offense right away, or more of a long term concern? Do you think that the Rams drafted him uh, primarily because you know there is that kind of question mark a little bit right now around Todd Gurley, or yeah. do you think? <laughs> I think yes to, to everything you're saying. I think he's someone he's someone who can catch the ball. He's an explosive player. Sean McVay also, and, and this is something that no one's really talked about, and I hope you guys talk about it in your future podcast. This guy evolves. Okay, he evolves. He knows by the end of last year there was enough film on what they're doing, 11 personnel, one running back, one tight end, three wides, with a lot of eye candy motion. So he knows a lot of people have seen, a lot of people are cop- are copying that. So he's going to change some things offensively. Maybe they do some two back, you know, with Gurley and Henderson or Malcolm Brown and Henderson. They do some things that give them a different look. So this isn't just, again, knowing Les Snead and all these guys, this isn't a move that was made just because, okay, if Todd Gurley can't go, we've got to have him, you know, in, in the in the lineup on deck, just in case Malcolm Brown, you know, this is also something where this offense is going to evolve. Watch, there's going to be some different some different wrinkles in here that we're going to see that no one's really talking about because we're the, at this point in the off season. But more than anything, I think again Henderson's a guy with depth wise, and somebody in the future. I mean, Ty Gurley, he got the big contract. Um, we'll see how well he plays into it, but in, but in a year or two, they may it may be time for them to move on, and they've got somebody in house on a rookie deal because they're going to have to pay Jared Goff big money. So, you know, you have to look at the economics of some of the roster building and some of the roster moves as well. Yeah, I, I firmly, you know, agree with that. You know, Henderson coming into uh, the NFL draft, I had him rated as the number one running back. So this is somebody I thought could have gone, you know, late first round. And there were a lot of people that really liked um, you know, obviously Josh Jacobs, who came in at number two for me and Miles Sanders. Uh, but I just, you know, love the way Henderson ran. And I think it's funny. He's wearing number 27. He reminds me a lot of Trey Mason. And I think he's got more upside, but it's almost like getting a chance to see Todd Gurley and Trey Mason like, you know, we wanted to. Uh, people forget, you know, Mason was somebody, he had that home run hitting ability. He was just coming off a year where he, you know, shared carries with Zach Stacy and was supposed to be, you know, the impressive, you know, I guess change of pace back to Todd Gurley. I mean, we weren't expecting the Rams to even make that pick. Um, unfortunately the stuff that happened off the field, you know, Mason ends up not being the guy, but, um, you know, now you get a chance to see that because I mean, you know, I really like Malcolm Brown. I, I really do. And, uh, you know, people forget he was a five-star recruit in high school. He was the number one running back <laughs> He's a real high school. He's a explosive player. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, he ends up going undrafted. And, and we see that a lot. You know, guys will go undrafted that were, you know, severely, uh, you know, either underrated or overrated in, in you know, coming out of high school and, and they didn't pan out in college or maybe they did, but not as well. Uh, but Malcolm Brown has put together a, a nice uh, little career here. And I think he's going to continue to develop, but um, I just think, Dar- you know, Darrell Henderson is just somebody that you could be looking at as a top 10 back someday. And I think he is fairly similar to Alvin Kamara in a sense where honestly, the way it seems like the league's going, Steve is, is teams are going to, you know, start leaning on that uh, committee backfield, if they haven't already. Um, You know, you see Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram. Obviously, now Mark Ingram's with Baltimore. Baltimore grabbed uh, the um, Oklahoma State running back, uh, Justice Hill. Um, So they'll they'll add him to that mix. And and there's just, you know, there's, <clears throat> There's uh, timeshare backs all over the place. I mean, um, you know, the Eagles just got Miles Sanders, who we were talking about, and now he's going to go and he's going to uh, be with um, the guy they just got from uh, Jordan uh, his Howard. Name is, yeah, yeah, Jordan, Jordan Howard. Howard. So, uh, I mean, that's incredible. Like, it just seems like the league is now switching more to that. And I wonder, you know, if Todd Gurley is kind of like the cautionary tale where, you know, the Rams obviously gave him the money 
And uh, I remember, I think, I don't know if you reported it or not, um, at, you know, week one, he injured his knee and, and like he thought he was done for the year after the Raiders game. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think it was you. Flared up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, so, yeah, I mean, several people had it, but that knee flared up and they were concerned about it. Yeah. So I, I think, honestly, this is kind of – if the trend hasn't already started, I think the trend is starting. And I think, um, you know, Darrell Henderson can be that guy. And I think they might have even considered drafting him, you know, with Todd Gurley, question mark, or without it. But I, um, you know, I, I think it, it's definitely, I thought it was the right move. I know some people didn't like it, but, you know, I think you just got a, a first-round talent in the third round. That's that's kind of how I saw that. Well, let's not forget Malcolm Brown's coming off a major injury as well. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> I know he he got he got hurt after that spectacular touchdown. The Saints game, one of the most incredible touchdowns of the of the season. He gets hurt, so that's how come we ended up seeing T.J. Anderson. They just had they just ran out of running backs. So I mean they they want increased depth there. They want increased competition. But again, knowing Sean McVay and this guy is a freaking Sven Golly. He is <laughs> everyone's trying to hire the next Sean McVay. It ain't gonna happen. He is he is something different. He is concocting something right now with all these running backs that teams have not seen from the Rams before. Definitely. And, and, you know, speaking of Henderson, you know, how, in your opinion, how well do you think the Rams did in this year's draft? Hard to tell. You know, the Rams were less Snead. I've known him since he worked with the Falcons, and I used to cover the Falcons back in Atlanta. He, he, he learned under a lot of really good drafters and a lot of really good personnel people to be methodic in terms of you're drafting guys to not only play for you this year and hopefully contribute, like to how they nailed it with Cooper Cup and how, you know, some of the other players they've drafted, you know, came out and played right away. But then two years ago, remember, they, they draft Joe Noteboom and they draft the center well, those guys are going to start this year. Nopum's going to be the starting left guard, replacing Roger Saffold, and Allen's going to be their center. You know, and, and I'm blanking on the wide receiver who came in for Cooper Cup last year. I mean, he was fantastic. Josh Reynolds, um, developmental guy. So some of the things, some of the players that they drafted this year, they're going to be asked to possibly play right away. But they've got a really, really talented roster. And if they can redshirt a couple of these guys, so to speak, they will, but I mean Henderson's one of those guys who's going to become he's going to be asked to play right away. I mean he plays a position. Taylor Rapp, you know we'll see. I mean we'll see if he can come in at safety. They need to increase a little bit of speed there. They lost Lamarcus Joyner, who was a tough, tough guy, but didn't have the season last year that they thought he would have. So I mean I'm sure they're they're expecting some things from him as well, you know. And and they're in a division now where Cliff Kingsbury's coming in. He's going to try to throw the ball a million different ways. And, um, Kyle Shanahan's got Jimmy Garoppolo back. So that defense is going to be pushed a little bit more. And we know Russell Wilson, he lost Doug Baldwin, so, you know, his, his key receiver. But he's he's so incredible. I mean, that division is going to be really, really tough. But the Niners are one of those teams that I think is going to take a big jump. Seattle's going to be right there. So we'll see how many of these rookies play. But some of them at some point are really going to have to contribute. Yeah, I I definitely agree with that. And I think it's funny, you know, that you mentioned, you know, this division is going to be tough because, you know, for a while the division wasn't tough. And then, you know, I said last year, you know, watch out for, you know, the 49ers. I thought the Cardinals could do something. Unfortunately, the Cardinals, that kind of backfired. But I think this year all the teams look formidable. I mean, I don't, I don't think, you know, if there was any year where I'd be, you know, totally unsure about the Rams, you know, in Sean McVay's um, era, you know, sweeping the division, it'd be this year. And it has nothing to do with the Rams, you know, skill set or anything like that. It's just, I feel like now, you know, Kyler Murray kind of levels the playing field. They have something that, you know, obviously Russell Wilson in Seattle. So Seattle has that, you know, type of, you know, mobility factor to it. But I just feel like Kyler Murray's a little different. Um, You know, people compare him to Russell Wilson. I see that, but I feel like Russell Wilson is more so, you know, looking to throw a lot more than uh, Kyler is. I feel like Kyler can house it if possible. And, uh, you know, Russell Wilson, somebody I think he could also, you know, he could run the distance, but he's not as explosive, in my opinion, um, as a a pure runner um, than Kyler Murray. But I think also at the same time, you know, playing against Russell Wilson all those years, I think will help the Rams, um, you know, combat 
whatever, you know, Kyler Murray and, and Cliff Kingsbury bring to the table. But, I mean, it's definitely going to be an interesting uh, division. But kind of, you know, moving on, um, we have this interesting segment idea, or I had this interesting segment idea. I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. Claim it, claim uh, it, claim it. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> extension or no extension. I know, such a great title, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I, I got to ask you, because we're, we're going to go down the list here. I have some names of players, and I want to know, uh, if you believe they'll get an extension from the Rams and in kind of like, you know, a time frame, uh, if they, you know, if they do get extension, when would it be? So the the first one uh, is Jared Goff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but they've got time with him. I mean, they've got a year after this one. Maybe they get it done after the season. He's eligible. Um, but they'll see which players are going to bring back and, and see what their cap is. But yeah, well, yeah. I mean, you, you get a quarter... Everyone wants to say Jerry Goff is only okay. He's pretty damn good. I mean, Jerry Goff has gotten a lot better. Okay, maybe he's not Aaron Rodgers, but he's pretty darn good. Um, and they've got a lot of young weapons around him. He's going to get extended. He's going to be the next $30 million quarterback as much as that's going to make people cringe. That's the market. Um, I, I think it'll happen probably before next season, but they've got another year to play with that and get it done. Well, I'm glad that you think – you know, he's pretty good because I said that on Twitter the other day and Twitter went insane (laughs) as, as Jake knows, I got, um, I don't know if you've been looking at those quarterback tier, um, things they've kind of been on Twitter. It's like this thing where you, you, there's categories for quarterbacks and you kind of rank them. It's, it's supposed to be fun, but people get really into it. And, uh, I had Goff ranked pretty high and people were, really felt a type of way about it. It was, it was kind of funny um, looking back at it, but um, I'm glad to see that I'm clearly not the only no, one with that opinion. He's a, he's a good player. He's a young player. You know, is he Russell Wilson in that, in that stratosphere? No, he's not, but he's ahead of Jimmy Garoppolo. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's a good young player and especially for what Sean McVay does, they are a perfect fit together. You know, I, now here's a question: Would you take him or Andy Dalton? I take him a thousand, a thousand times, times. Of a thousand. all day, all day, all day. So, so there you go. So you know, people want to, you know, blast you on Twitter or whatever. Great, he's not in the same tier as a Big Ben or Russell Wilson or or Brady or Aaron Rodgers or or you know Matt Ryan. But you know, he he ain't too far in that Matthew Stafford category in terms of ability and you know things he can grow to in the future. Definitely. And the next player that uh, for extension or no extension that I'm going to bring up is Robert Woods. Yeah, I I would think they would extend Woods, you know, unless, you know, some somehow the market's going to get blown up for him. But, you know, he's he's a he's such a reliable player. He's such a good player. Uh, He's tough. I mean, every time they need a play, look at him in the Super Bowl. I mean, he's. He was fantastic. I mean, all, all through the, the playoffs, you have Robert Woods. Because, again, his, his deal is not going to be like Sammy Watkins when he went to Kansas City. That just completely blew apart the wide receiver market and it created this unbelievable weight scale. You know, he's not going to be one of those guys making $14 million a year on average. So, yes, Robert Woods. Robert Woods will get extended. I don't know when it will happen. But I think they'll take care of him, and I, and I think he'd want to stay here. Yeah, I'm I'm really obviously I'm glad to hear that. Um he's become one of my favorite players and you know, just being from upstate New York, I've seen plenty of Robert Woods in a Buffalo Bills uniform and just how the I just don't feel like the fans here appreciated him. Um it was always Sammy Watkins and if even if he couldn't go or like, you know, it was you know, Robert Woods is a bum or whatever. It's just to me, I think when you watch the film, he brings everything to the table. The guy can uh, you know, block as, as well as any, you know, uh wide receiver, and I think that's <clears throat> one of the main reasons why, you know, Sean McVay grabbed him. You know, the sh- the sure hands um, just, you know, being able to kind of, you know, change his positioning on the field, find that soft zone and be able to kind of sit over the middle, you know, get that first down and hold on to the ball. You know, I think this is somebody that has strong hands. He's reliable. He's a great route runner and he's a great blocker. So I, I definitely and agree. I think they I'm should glad, bring I'm him glad you did that. La- I'm glad you did that last part because look to see why Ty Gurley gets so many of those long runs. Cause you got number 17. <laughs> You got seventeen locking somebody up downfield. I mean, he's he's that all around guy. He's still young, 
you know, and, and to say, you know, saying up up in Buffalo, I didn't appreciate him. I mean, it wasn't like they had uh, Jared Goff throwing the ball to him yeah. when, when he was up there either. <laughs> you know, they they had they had some issues offensively during his time there. Oh yeah, they definitely did. Um, moving on, uh, Dante Fowler Jr. I, I really like this kid, and I'm hoping uh, he continues to develop and the Rams keep him. But what are your thoughts? That that one's going to be interesting. It's going to be, you know, he's a one-year, $14 million deal this year. He was really, really good, like the final four games. Um, we have to see, you know, we have to see him do it over the long haul. He, you know, he he fell out of the rotation behind Yannick Ngakwe in Jacksonville. Um, he came here. It was new. He's playing alongside of Sue and Donald and just really thrived in what Wade Phillips wanted him to do. Now they've got him paired opposite of Clay Matthews. Um, it's it's going to be real interesting to see. I, at that number, at the $14 million number, I think he's really going to have to probably hit double-digit sacks and, and be a wrecker. But that, that might be one position where the Rams continue to do what they've done, and that's just kind of roll in those edge rushers. Remember, they went from Connor Barwin to – they, you know, they brought him in last year. You know, they had Samson and Bukum on, on the other side. And, uh, you know, that's going to be an interesting position because they've got, you know, that Aaron Donald contract is great. They got rid of the Sioux deal, and, and Fowler kind of picked up that contract at $14 million. But once they pay Jared Goff, it, it's, you know, it'll be interesting to see if they target a young pass rusher next year because they can get that player on a rookie contract instead of, uh, paying a big deal to someone like a Dante Fowler, so that one, that one, I, that's that's one where I feel like th- that's a big wait and see. I, I I love the kid; he's a fantastic young kid, a lot of energy, but I think he's got this is a prove it year for him, and that's why it's a one year deal. Oh yeah, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, and the next guy that I'm going to bring up is another defensive guy in Michael Brockers. What are your thoughts on him? Yeah, Brock. Um, Love him. They love him. It just all depends on the salary. You know, he plays a position, you know, that, that, that four, five, six technique defensive end. Sometimes he slides in a nose tackle, which he'll probably do more this year with Sue gone. Um, but he's incredibly valuable. But if the number, if the number gets crazy, if he's trying to get up there in 10, 11 million dollars, that's one where they could, they could possibly move on. But he's someone, I mean, I know they love him. They love him and then the dirty work that he does. Um, so so we'll see. I mean, look, Brock's been in the league. What's this, about year number seven or eight for Brockers, if if not a little bit longer? So, you know, they've got to look at the age. But if he continues to produce like he is and the number isn't too crazy, yeah, Brockers is in his eighth season. You know, the number's not too crazy. I'm sure they'd love to have him back because he's, he's a grinder, man. He – he really, you know, frees up Aaron Donald to do a lot of things. Oh yeah, and he's he's great because I remember exactly how the Rams got him. They traded down with the Cowboys, who the Cowboys selected Mo Claiborne, and the Rams were somehow able to sneak Brockers in there at sixteen. And I mean, you know, many thought he was going to be a top five pick. So I think, you know, seeing getting that value there, and then just having him be able to call him a, a 2019 to 20, you know, Los Angeles Ram is just something, you know, I don't think many people expect it. I mean, you know, obviously you, you love them, but um, it, it's always cool to see those picks pan out because, I mean, you look at guys like, you know, Tavon Austin, you know, they were really ecstatic trading up and getting him at eight and, you know, that didn't work. And then that same draft, what was great value in getting Alec Ogletree at 30, um, you know, now he's not with the Rams anymore. He was actually the first signing yeah. in the Sean McVay era. So um, that brings me to my next point. Corey Littleton, the guy that kind of might have pushed Alec Ogletree kind of out of the plans. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, on Yeah, I mean, look, he, he, he's a highly productive player. He fits into what Wade Phillips does. Um, you know, the one thing that we saw with the Ogletree, they're not going to pay that position. That is not going to be a high-dollar position. Littleton's not going to command a huge salary. So I think, I think they'll extend him, you know, unless some other team falls in love with him and wants to pay him you know, like an Ogletree type of contract. Um, but, you know, you, you just realized, you know, the year after they gave Ogletree that big contract, they're like, well, we've got to clear that out. Because I mean, keep, keep in mind that Jared Goff contract is coming up. <laughs> and that is a position just, just historically they want a fast chase-type linebacker 
um, who can stick his nose in there when he has to, but they want somebody who can go sideline to sideline, who can cover. And Littleton, you know, he's a three-down guy, and, and and I think that's someone they would love to extend, unless he just has one of these monster years and and his contract number goes through the roof. Yeah, and you know, this next guy that I'm going to bring up is Marcus Peters, and this is interesting to me because something that I've kind of been saying um, when they the Rams added Marcus Peters and they added a key to lead is that this is the last year that Marcus Peters and and Aqib, I believe, have on their contract. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, But they can't keep both of them. That's kind of been my philosophy. I I think they're both going to kind of want um, a big contract, maybe not Aqib, but I know Marcus will. And I've kind of been saying that if it comes down to them both, the obvious choice is going to be Marcus Peters. I mean, he's younger. Personally, I think he's a bit more productive. Uh, so do you think the Rams are, are going to go all in on Marcus Peters? I do. I really do. They like him. He fits it Wade Phillips likes to do. Now, the one thing, you know, remember last year when he had a little bit of a rough patch and then he had that, the, the play against the Saints where Michael Thomas got behind him. He is not a press man corner. He is an off man corner, meaning he's not going to get up in someone's chest for a full game. And he's not going to be the guy that necessarily follows the best receiver around, even though he's done that. He's very really capable. But he was so good over those final six or seven games. You know, I, that, that game against the Saints, some of the criticism that he, he, he had, he really tightened it up. And I, and I think Marcus Peters, you know, some people might be like, oh, if he gets the money, he's going to be this. Shit. No, Marcus Peters, like I, re- I know Marshawn Lynch very well, and we know how tight Marcus Peters is with Marshawn Lynch. These guys are not the type to let money get to them. They've they've come up a certain way personally. They are they are dogs um, in the way they approach things. And I think Marcus Peters is a player that you know they're going to have to pay. And that's why I think again we're getting back to like Dante Fowler and those types of positions to pay. I think Peters is someone that they're going to have to keep in that secondary, which is which is a sec a good secondary. And with Akeeb, I think this will probably be his last year. Um, We'll see if he wants to play again, but he may end up being a year-to-year type guy. And if he's willing to sign one-year deals at affordable numbers, then I think they'll hang on to him. Yeah, and I mean, they they just signed uh, Troy Hill to an extension. They drafted David Long. Um, obviously, you have Nikel Ruby Coleman in, in the slot. Um, you know, I, I think... I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean that that you know being comfortable. I think people were really hard on Peters in his first year, um, but it, you know really he didn't get to, a chance to play next to Akib Talib. I mean really Talib got hurt in that Chargers game, and that was early on in the year, and I think that really hurt him um, because I mean it was it was really just all him. So you know they they definitely um made it their mission to target him and then of course in the playoffs magically everything gets better when guys get healthy and you know there's that uh that chemistry and that you know just being able to gel and and I mean when they got Barron back too like I know Barron is now going to play for the Pittsburgh Steelers but you know Mark Barron is somebody that I think it wasn't appreciated enough either so um he was he was just too he was just too injured I mean that was yeah. that was the problem with Mark Barron but you know, let's let's keep in mind, you know, when Marcus really, I mean, he was, that's when Dante Fowler that pass rush went hand in hand. And oh, you know, yeah. the, it, it's how amazing is this? though? the player who the Rams acquired, who nobody is talking about, and it, it is one of my biggest question marks hanging over my head, is Clay Matthews. This guy's <laughs> one of the best pass rushers that the NFL has seen in a generation. He quietly signs late in free agency. He's playing in a Wade Phillips game, and Wade is going to turn him loose. And I think, you know, I think we are going to see a resurrection of number 52. And it is amazing. Look at how far we've gone into this, and we haven't brought him up. Yeah. I think he is someone who nobody in the NFL is talking about. Who He's back home. The Rams are located. their training facility out near where he grew up. I think he is going to wreck people. <laughs> um, I think he's going to have a fantastic season. Again, nobody's accounting for him. Yeah, okay, he wasn't the same guy he was. Remember the Packers for years, they were using him inside. He was out of position. And then they they were tweaking some things on defense with him from Mike Patton to Dom Capers and just wasn't the same in the same role. Mm. I think playing in Wade Phillips' defense, <laughs> Clay Matthews and, and, and Fowler, um, 
you know, no one's talking about it, but I think I think that's a player uh, who's on a short-term deal who's who's really going to show up this year. That, that I mean, have you heard anyone talk about him? No, I, I've heard a lot of Weddle. Um, you know, I think, right. you know, we do have the USC fan base that follows us um, that are Rams fans, and obviously they love Clay. But I think really it's been dominated by Weddle. But one guy I'll bring up that no one's talking about. So your guy, uh, Steve, is, um, you know, Clay Matthews here. I'm going to say John Franklin Myers, the guy that got the fumble in the Super Bowl. I mean, he forced that fumble on Tom Brady. That was huge. Uh, he also won the game for the Rams, or rather sealed it against the Vikings um, earlier in the season. So I think he didn't get a ton of time to play, but like when he did, his efficiency I felt like was off the charts. So uh, interesting call. He, yeah, interesting he's gonna call. I gotta hang on to that one. Okay. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, John Franklin Myers, Stephen F. Austin. He's been on the show before too, so I might be a little biased, but I mean, there, hey, there can, you go, there can, you go. <laughs> can you be biased though, when uh, guys coming out there and putting out results? I don't know. It's it's kind of hard. Like, you know, I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> just saying. You can go for it. Just go for it. Own it, man. Own it. JFM, remember the name. <laughs> you're you're uh, Jake is actually the president of the JFM fan club. That's a I fun am. fact. He's the, how deep, the founder. How deep, how deep is that fan club? How deep is that fan club? Um, I I don't I don't even know who's on it. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I know Jake, I did call his. Uh, I said he's going to strip sack Tom Brady in the Super Bowl. Um, I put it on Facebook, and boom, it happened. <laughs> so there you go. Well, the last guy that we're going to bring up for the um, extension or no extension is kind of low-key turning into one of my favorite Rams uh, just because I think he's got so much potential and I don't even think he's really even touched the surface uh, of what he can do in this league and that's John Johnson the third do you think that he's fantastic player yeah I mean he's just isn't he a beast he is a beast you know the only knock on him is he's not fleet of foot I mean that's it but he has that's the guy, and I think him playing against, you know, playing alongside Lamarcus Joyner, who's one of the toughest guys. And Joyner is a really small guy. I mean, one safety, and you ask through some of the things he's done, just incredibly tough. But but John Johnson playing alongside him and seeing how tough Joyner was, no, they love him. They love him, and um, you know, that's that's a player when it comes time to extend him. We'll see. I mean, that's that's another position where the Rams, you know, you haven't seen them commit overly long term to a guy at that position. But I think he's, I think he is a rock uh, of the of the foundation in that secondary. They'll probably maybe they'll keep rotating the Eric Weddles of the world in at that other spot. You know, but again, they drafted the young men with the first, you know, their first pick this year. Um, to come in and play safety as, as well, but John Johnson, I think, is is, is going to be there. I mean, he's a he is a big time player with great instincts. You know, maybe he's never going to be a, a Pro Bowl type, but he's going to be one of those guys who's going to be really good for several years. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, it's funny, I agree with it, Steve, but I'll, I'll be the first one to admit that I hated the pick when it happened. <laughs> I uh, I had my eye on Chris Godwin. So when the Rams picked Cup, I obviously liked Cup, but it was just a matter of you know. And then um, I wanted Godwin, and I wanted the the kid that went to uh, the Chargers, uh, Desmond King. So I mean, you know, I, I think they would have been fine with either or. But I, I'm I'm glad to have John Johnson. <laughs> I'll, I'll admit my mistake. Good. He's, he's a good man. He's a good player. I mean, yeah. he, he, the, the fact that he's grown so much year by year. I think is real promising. And then being against, you know, sav- you know playing alongside a savant, you know, like Weddle is going to help him by leaps. But Eric Weddle is going to do for that defense what Andrew Whitworth did for that offensive unit. Because the one thing that defense has not had is like that leader. I mean, Aaron Donald's a quiet guy who kills people. And Dominic and Sue's <laughs> just this real cerebral guy who's kind of to himself. Um, you know, Ogletree kind of was – when he was there, but Weddle's the guy who everyone's going to be like, okay, let's look at Weddle. You know, let's, let's, let's hear what he has to say. He's, he's just got that gravitas no matter where he goes. And he's, even if it's only a one year loaner, he's going to have a significant impact on that defense. 
in that regard. Yeah, no, I I definitely agree, and I I was really happy with the the Weidel, uh the Weddle move. Um, you know, just seeing, you know what. I mean, honestly, just seeing how Tony Jefferson was reacting to not having him as his running mate anymore, um, you could tell the Rams were getting a, a really good player and the Ravens were losing a really good player. But, um, you know, we're going to wrap it up here because, I mean, you're a busy man and we're, we're taking up your whole night. Um, but we, we really appreciate you coming on, of course. Uh, wrap it up here with, with some final questions. Um, Steve, who is the, the Rams' biggest threat, in your opinion, in the NFC? Oh, and the entire NFC? Hmm. Wow. I mean, the NFC is, you know, the, the Eagles, it's funny, they, they, they match up. That's a tough matchup for the Rams for whatever reason, and I think the <laughs> Eagles are going to be good. I'm, I'm big on Carson Wentz. Same I am here. A, I am a big – people are going to – I know Nick Foles is a guy there, but I am big on Carson Wentz, and I think uh, the Vikings are going to be back this year. I mean, they had so much disruption last year, getting rid of the offensive coordinator – the Everson Griffin thing, I think the Vikings are going to be a very, very tough out. Um, you know, I'm not as high on the Cowboys as a lot of people are. I think their defense is going to be outstanding. Um, but, I mean, in, in the division, I mean, the Seattle. Seattle, they've, they've got something going there, man. I mean, they don't have a ton of big names. You know, losing Doug Baldwin hurts, but they've they've got a whole new type of mojo where they're really going to – they're going to be a tough team – um, to contend with. So those, those are the teams I would, I would put up there right now. Cause I, but I, cause I think the Rams are, are going to be right back in play to make a run for the Super Bowl. I think they're that, that good. And I, I think Sean McVay and Les Need just have such great synergy and they're so creative. I, I think they're going to be right back in the hunt. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think so too. And uh, I know Jake does as well. And we're certainly hoping that uh, that's the case. And, you know, just in your opinion, and there might be a couple answers to this question, but uh, is there one person or maybe a couple people that you feel will be the Rams' biggest breakout candidates this season? Wow. Um, haven't really, you know, haven't really thought, but Josh Johnson definitely has got to be on that list. I mean, I, I just, I, I know they love him, and I, and I, I think he's a, a fantastic player. Um, I think the big question is to see how this offensive line holds up. I mean, losing Sullivan and, and losing um, Saffold, putting two young players there, it would be interesting to see if Rob Havenstein can be a little bit more consistent. Um, so I, I, you know, I think you got to look at Joe Noteboom to see, you know, if he can come in and play like Saffold, then they might have found themselves a long-term gem on that offensive line. Yeah, I'm really excited to see uh, Joe Nopum had a chance to see him at the Senior Bowl, and I, I think they got, uh, I think they got a good player in him and Brian Allen. Um, I wasn't as high on you know when they drafted him, but I'm I think in limited, and I'm talking real limited snaps uh, last year in relief for John Sullivan. I, I was impressed. Again, real limited, small sample size, but I think he'll be solid. Um, really just believe in what Aaron Cromer can do. So at the end of the day, you know, whatever they decide to go with, I think you could say this is the most depth filled offensive line the Rams have had in quite some time because, you know, you add, uh, you know, Bobby Evans and, um, you know, you, you go out and get David Edwards. And I, I just, to me, that that's kind of where I see it here. And and Jamil Demby as well uh, from Maine last year. So I do, I do like the way, um, like I'm talking after the starters, I think they have a lot in the back end. Now, are the NFL ready? That's, you know, a bigger question, but, uh, my final question for you, Steve, as we, uh, we let you go here and really appreciate you again, coming on. It's been a blast. What are you most looking forward to, um, in the whole NFL season, you know, 2019 to 2020 season, like what, what are you most looking forward to as far as the whole, you know, NFL goes? My two biggest, it's the same thread. And the two players and the two seasons I am looking at, and this is an outside the box storyline, but are Marcus Mariota and James Winston. The one and two Ooh. picks, they are in their option years. Neither one has convinced anybody that they're that guy. Okay, no one is, uh, how the Cowboys are sold on Dak Prescott and how the Eagles are sold on Carson Wentz, the Rams are sold on Jared Goff. Nobody is sold on those two. And this is, these are, this is amazing for both of those players. 
Um, Winston gets a tough coach who is going to be all over him and Bruce Arians, but someone who could really turn him into that guy. And for Marcus Mariota, it is all about durability. If he can stay healthy, then I'm sure they'll commit to him. But right now, you know, there's a whole lot of questions about him. So those are, those are two players who have a tremendous amount of talent, came in with all the fanfare, who we could be talking about, you know, as backup type quarterbacks next season if, if they flop. So, so to me, that's, that's the big storyline I'm going into the season with. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I haven't even really thought about that. Um, but, but I definitely agree with you. I think that's something that, that people should keep an eye on for sure. Yeah, I like that as well. Big Mariota fan, so I'm hoping he bounces back. And um, I like Winston at FSU, so you know I'm hoping he bounces back as well. And I kind of believe Arians is the guy to do it if you know anybody can. Exactly. Well, Steve, we can't thank you enough for coming on. I mean, it was really awesome to get to talk to you, and uh, you know we're both, as I mentioned before, big big fans. So it was really cool to kind of pick your brain a little bit and get to know more about you. And, uh, you know, we know that you'll be watching along with us this next NFL season, uh, probably eyes glued to the screen as I know I will be. And, uh, hopefully, you know, the Rams can, can, uh, kick it this year. We'll see. That's why they, that's why they play all 16. We'll see. <laughs> but thanks so much for having me on guys. It, it has been absolutely fun. You guys are fantastic. Just holler at me, uh, you know, if we want to do this again. You know, I, I hope I haven't sabotaged your ratings. And, uh, you know, John Franklin Myers fan club, I'm right there with you. Let's go. Oh, let's do it. <laughs> you know, we'll, I'm sure Jake will send you a T-shirt. I think he's getting T-shirts made. All right. I can assure you I haven't right, taken it that far. <laughs> there we go. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely, Steve. Uh, we'll be in touch, and uh, we'll definitely have you on. Uh, I mean, whenever you're free, we'd love to have you on again soon. All right. Take care, guys. All right, guys. So that is the show. Hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, for Jake Ellenbogen, she's Alexis Kraft, and that was Steve Weish of the NFL Network. This has been Episode 226 of the Downtown Rams podcast. So thanks again, guys, and take care. Take care.